to this virtual session of the 70th annual Utah State Historical Society Conference. I'm Holly George, editor of Utah Historical Quarterly. Today's presentation rescues from 150 years of neglect an exciting true tale of international intrigue involving the travails of Henrietta Polydor. Our speakers are Kenneth L. Alford, a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University, also, William P. McKinnon, an independent historian residing in Montecito, California, who has written extensively about territorial Utah and the American West since 1963. McKinnon's articles, chapters, essays, and book reviews have appeared in more than 30 publications. We are privileged to have these gentlemen here today to tell this story. They have been writing and thinking about the Utah War for years, and it is an honor to learn from them. And with that, I will turn it over to Ken Alford. Thank you. Well, great. We'll put some slides up here. And uh, we're glad to be with you today. And so the way this is going to work, uh, the title of this, we've got possibly one of the longest titles of the uh, conference this year. It's Fact, Fiction, and Polygamy, A Tale of Utah War Intrigue, 1857-1858. And it's specifically about A.G. Brown's publication, The Ward of the Three Guardians. And so the way we're going to handle this is Bill and I are going to tag team throughout this presentation. And we're going to, uh, I'll set the stage, uh, briefly give an overview of the Utah War. Bill will talk about who Albert uh, G. Brown, A.G. Brown Jr. was, and what the 1877 Ward of the Three Guardians publication was. Then I'll talk about the cast of characters, because it's really an amazing cast of characters for a single story. Then Bill will pick up the main storyline and, and uh, give the plot. Um, I'll come in with some epilogue information, and then uh, we'll let Bill bring it home uh, and share some conclusions. And then, uh, Holly, if you've got any questions for us, we'll be happy to, to answer those. So to get started, the Utah War is just unique in the military history of the United States. Um, it's the, uh, the largest deployment of forces between the Mexican-American War and the American Civil War. And it's actually where a lot of the uh, folks that participate in the Civil War uh, cut their teeth right before the Civil War militarily. And it's a, a period that follows Utah becoming a territory in 1850. And once Utah becomes a territory, then the federal government is sending out um, and selecting the governor and Supreme Court justices and other federal officials for the territory. And to say that that's a rocky relationship uh, just probably puts a nicety on it. It's a, it's a contentious relationship sometimes and just painful on both sides. And so over the years, as we approach <clears throat> the Buchanan presidency, we see headlines like these. These are just taken uh, out of the New York Times during that period. But quite honestly, it, it could have been almost any day. There are headlines like this almost throughout that 1857-58 period um, concerned with what's going on in the territory of Utah. And so just briefly about the war, what happens is in 1856, the Republican, a brand new party, they run a, their presidential candidate, John C. Fremont, and the Republicans come out with two major platforms. They're against the, the twin pillars of barbarism, which are slavery and polygamy. And then Buchanan, the Democrat, the only bachelor to actually sit in the White House, um, is elected in that uh, November 1856 election. And so he takes action um, after receiving reports that there's trouble in Utah, that there's rebellion in Utah, and he hears some very serious charges. And so in the spring of 1857, he makes a decision to send the army out, and in May issues a presidential order ordering the army to march on Utah. Now they're going to install a new governor, replacing Brigham Young as governor, and put in some other federal officials in the territory, and generally, from their view, bring peace back to the territory. So the army leaves Kansas, and Kansas is having its own problems at that time um, in July. And then as they march out towards Utah, the Latter-day Saints send out the Nauvoo Legion, the Utah militia, and do a series of uh, defensive operations primarily, but also some offensive operations, burning grass and burning supply wagons and those kinds of things. And the army gets a late enough start and is slowed down just enough that they decide to winter 
near Fort Bridger at a place that they established called Camp Scott. And so what happens is, is we've then got uh, sitting about, we've got Fort Bridger and then we've got the Great Salt Lake and there's about 113 miles between them. And it's a, it's a nervous winter in 57, 58. And what happens is as the spring starts, Brigham Young knows that the army's going to come into Utah. And actually technically they're already in Utah because Fort Bridger is part of Utah territory at that time. But in March of 1858, Brigham Young calls a meeting in the old tabernacle. This is a picture of that uh, adobe building. And he calls there for what becomes known as the move south. And about 30,000 Latter-day Saints that live north of the point of the mountain actually move south. They, they almost empty out Salt Lake City, Ogden, Logan, all the areas uh, north up to the, the territorial border. And in the midst of all of this, what's going on is we've got uh, Albert City Johnston. That's why it's called Johnston's Army after after its uh, commander here. And um, they do come into the valley. I'm taking a long story and making it short. There are peace commissioners from the president who offers pardons, and the army marches through Great Salt Lake City in June of of 1858. And so in the midst of all of this, then, this story that takes place that uh, Bill and I have, have written about uh, begins. And so we'll turn it over to Bill, and he'll talk about who A.G. Brown was. Bill, I think you're muted. It's a... Uh... Nice to be back as part of a Utah State History Conference. I've been a member of the society since 1963, and I learned long ago that anything that the society puts on is fun and interesting. So great to be part of this event in October of 2022 also. Uh, I'm going to cover two questions. One was, who was Albert G. Brown <coughs> Jr., who you see on this slide? And secondly, what was his Ward of the Three Guardians, and why did he write it? Brown, uh, by way of background, it, I'll mention, was born in 1835 in Salem, Massachusetts, into a well-to-do uh, family engaged in maritime and mercantile procedures. Uh, Albert's father was a ship chandler actively involved in the China trade that sailed out of Salem during the 1800s. Uh, they were uh, a well-to-do but not wealthy family. And although they lived in Salem, they also were very well connected in Boston where Mr. Brown Sr. had his office. They were what Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, Sr. called Boston Brahmins. And uh, that was sort of a, a tribe to which they belonged. Young Albert, uh, Went to, went to school in Salem. Then at the age of 13, he was ready to go to Harvard College. Uh, felt along with his parents that maybe he needed another year of maturing. So he entered Harvard at age 14 in 1849 and proceeded uh, through there in sort of a rocky degree. Uh, a very bright person, but not very disciplined. Sent home for a year, came back, finally graduated with his uh, class in 1853 and began the study of law uh, immediately after that. In 1854, he got involved in one of his father's activities, which was abolitionism. And as you all remember, Boston was a hotbed of that. And in the course of pursuing anti-slavery agitation, the Browns found themselves one day in the middle of a riot, uh, which was focused on returning uh, on freed rather a fugitive slave Anthony Brown, Anthony Burns rather, who had been captured in Boston and was about to be returned by the federal government to the plantation in Virginia from which he had escaped. And in the course of attempting to free Anthony Burns from the federal marshals and U.S. Army troops, the mob killed a constable in Boston near Faneuil Hall and several prominent Bostonians, including this man, uh, A.G. Brown Jr. were arrested uh, for homicide. And 
Young Brown spent about two weeks uh, in jail. There was a lot of publicity, uh, flowers and candy and food sent to his jail cell. And then the indictment against him was dropped. And at that point, the family decided maybe the best thing for Albert to do would be to leave the United States, go to Heidelberg, Germany, and study for a PhD rather than continuing on with his law studies. So he did that, uh, returned to Boston in 1856 with a PhD. Uh, the United States at that time had no doctoral programs of that kind, so Germany was the hotbed of higher education, and Brown took advantage of that. Once back in uh, Boston in 1856, he was at loose ends and uh, trying to figure out what to do with the rest of his life. He was dabbling in newspaper reporting in Boston for local newspapers. He completed uh, his legal education and a master's degree at Harvard and began a sort of apprenticeship in the legal office of John A. Andrew at Boston, uh, a very uh, promising and prominent lawyer in Boston who uh, at the beginning of the Civil War became the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. During the course of the summer of 1857, uh, and Ken, if you could uh, move to the next slide, please. There we are. Uh, in the summer of uh, 1857, through a chain of events that I'm not gonna go into now, but one that was very serendipitous, Albert Brown fell into a job with the New York Tribune, which Horace Greeley owned and edited at that time. And Greeley hired young Brown to be a war correspondent for his newspaper in New York. And Brown was sent west with the army to cover the Utah war for the New York Tribune. Uh, and what you see uh, in this slide is a photo of uh, Brown taken slightly after the Utah War on the left, and in the oval portrait, you see him as a graduating uh, senior from Harvard in 1853. And below the two photos are the uh, printed dispatches which the Tribune read from Brown, who wrote them uh, at length uh, each month. As a war correspondent for the Tribune, Brown was paid about $200 a month, which was about what Brigham Young was paid as a territorial governor. And it was such a high amount that Utah's delegate to Congress wrote a letter reporting all this to Brigham Young with sort of uh, uh, oohs and ahs about, look at this and what Horace Greeley is sending west. Uh, the undersigned dispatches that uh, Brown sent to the Tribune uh, were very well written and of uh, uh, special interest to his readers because he had very good access at Fort Scott and Camp, uh, at Fort Bridger and Camp Scott. Uh, he got himself a job as a clerk of the U.S. District Court there because of his legal training, and that gave him privileged access to all kinds of legal documents. Uh, he was known uh, in the camp uh, by Jim Bridger, who couldn't read or write, as doctor because of his PhD from Heidelberg. And uh, the, the reporting that he did for the Tribune during 1857 and 1858 was so good that some of the army officers uh, in the Utah expedition wrote home, in the case of Captain Albert Tracy, wrote home to Buffalo to ask that a subscription to the Tribune be sent to him by mail to Camp Scott. Uh, the, the camp was so big that Captain Tracy used Brown's dispatches in the Tribune mailed to him to find out what was going on on the other end of the camp. It was that big and his writing was that uh, informative. The highlight of probably uh, Albert Brown's involvement with the Utah War was <clears throat> a request from Albert Sidney Johnston, the commander of the Utah Expedition in January of 1858 that he returned to the East Coast to carry dispatches to President Buchanan and to uh, the General in Chief Winfield Scott. And it was a 2000 trip, mile trip taken in the dead of winter. Uh, that, was, that was quite an adventure. And then in the spring of 1858, Brown came back to Camp Scott 
and resumed writing uh, the dispatches. After uh, Albert Sidney Johnson and the Utah expedition marched into Salt Lake City, as Ken described, uh, Brown stayed on for a few more months during the summer, wrote more dispatches, and then to avoid being trapped for the winter of 1858-59, he left just as the snow started to fall in Salt Lake City, returned to Boston in the fall of 1858, and spent 1859 lecturing and writing on the East Coast about the Utah War. And he published in 1859 a three-part uh, essay called The Utah Expedition for the Atlantic Monthly in Boston. And uh, like his dispatches for the Tribune, uh, that three-part article was not signed. So uh, Brown remained anonymous during all this time, although in Boston, it was still such a small community that it was an open secret that it was Brown who was doing the writing. He resumed the practice of law as well as writing about the Utah War. And uh, when the Civil War broke out, uh, he uh, was appointed by his uh, mentor in the law practice, Governor Andrew, to be his military secretary and a lieutenant colonel in the Union Army. After the Civil War, Brown worked as the reporter for the Massachusetts uh, uh, state court system and eventually gravitated to New York in the 1860s and 1870s, where he was a newspaper editor of some providence. And while he was there, he wrote Ward of the Three Guardians for the Atlantic Monthly, which he had uh, uh, written for in 1859 when he came back from Utah. Next slide, please, Ken. What Albert Brown wrote uh, while he was working in New York in 1877 for the Atlantic Monthly, published in Boston, was an essay titled uh, The Ward of the Three Guardians. And here you see the uh, sort of titling as it appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in June of 1877. This article uh, was different than what Brown had written earlier in the sense that it was signed. Uh, it was then known that it was Albert G. Brown, Jr who was uh, doing the writing. Unlike his dispatches in 1858 and his three-part series in the Atlantic Monthly in 59, which were anonymous, this one was directly attributed to Brown. The reason why he wrote this 20 years after the Utah War, that is in June of 1877, is interesting. And he never fully explained it, but uh, Ken and I have concluded that one of the stimuluses of Brown's writing was that there had been a sea change in the print culture between New York and Boston in 1858-59 and what took place when Brown was in New York 20 years later in 1877. Uh, people were writing for attribution. They had their name attached to what they write, wrote in a way that they hadn't earlier. And some of Brown's Harvard classmates we're also publishing about their experiences uh, in uh, journals like the Atlantic Monthly. By the way, the Atlantic Monthly at this time was the most widely read English publication in all of Europe and North America. So it was a major coup to be published in that particular uh, publication. And one of Albert's classmates from the class of 1853 at Harvard wrote a series of articles about his experiences as a diplomat in Egypt. And we think in part that stimulated Albert to write a bit about what he had done in, uh, in Utah 20 years earlier. Another stimulus for Brown writing this uh, piece, which was uh, uh, what we'll later refer to as a nonfiction novel, was uh, the national fascination with Utah and the Mormons that had continued uh, as the century uh, progressed. Utah had been a staple area of interest for Americans and Europeans for decades at this point. And in 1877, a number of events came together, which we think prompted Brown to write this piece. For example, there were the trials and execution of John D. Lee in connection with the Mountain Meadows massacre. There was the death of Brigham Young three or four months after that, which uh, created a lot of national publicity and interest in the area. 
there was Anne Eliza Webb's lecture tour uh, after she divorced Young and uh, went east and embarked on a on a career of writing and lecturing. And, and that fed the fuel of interest in Utah and things Mormon. And then there was congressional legislation going on, uh, which uh, tightened uh, the strictures against polygamy and even the Church of Latter-day Saints on the part of Congress. All of this was going on, uh, and we think a stimulus to get Albert Brown to take pen in hand while an editor of newspapers in New York to write for this Boston Journal, The Atlantic Monthly. Uh, I'll be discussing uh, the plot of Ward of the Three Guardians in summer, summary fashion after Ken sketches for you uh, in a second the main <laughs> cast of characters that were in this novella. Ken? Okay, let's, uh, let's look at this cast of characters because for a single story to have as many major players on both sides of the Atlantic, I, I'm hard pressed to think of any other 19th century story that, that can do this. And so what I want to do is just kind of outline some of the key players that, that figure prominently in this story. The first person that I wanna talk about is Samuel W. Richards. And uh, we refer to him as, as the polygamist. He has six wives uh, before he's, he's finished marrying. He is the brother of Franklin D. Richards, who is an apostle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's the nephew of Willard Richards, who is also an apostle in the church, uh, one of the men that was with Joseph Smith when he was martyred in uh, Carthage Jail in Illinois. And, and so he comes from a very prominent church family. And as the story opens, Samuel Richards is the mission president in the British mission. He has taken over as mission president from his brother, Franklin D. Richards. And, and so this, this story begins in Britain while he is serving there as the, the mission president of the European mission, but his focus is on um, the United Kingdom. And at that time, there are about, oh, five to six times more members of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Great Britain than there are in Utah. And so it's the center of the, of the church membership-wise. Well, the next family that figures in is, is Jane Mayer, and she learns about Mormonism from Samuel W. Richards and um, becomes converted and and is is eventually baptized and her sister is named Henrietta Henrietta Meyer Polidor and I have to tell you there are three Henriettas in this story Henrietta Polidor's mother is a Henrietta and Henrietta Polidor's daughter is a Henrietta <laughs> and um, and so Henrietta Polidor uh, learns ab about the new faith of her sister Jane and uh, and joins the church and then she has as i mentioned her daughter henrietta henrietta is attending boarding school um, down london way and what happens is samuel w richard's time as mission president is ending he is going to be returning to utah um, and he invites jane to go uh, with him. They, they don't physically travel together, but, but they both travel to Utah. And Jane then talks to her sister, Henrietta, and they travel, they do the, the transatlantic voyage. And before they do, Henrietta Polidor basically leaves her husband, goes down to boarding school, and from her husband's point of view, kidnaps their daughter and takes her with her to the United States and eventually to Utah Territory. So that husband that loses his, his wife and his daughter in, in one fell swoop, his name is Henry. And his name initially is Polidori, the Italian um, version, and he anglicizes that to Polidor. And Henry is, he's very Catholic. Uh, he's a solicitor, a lawyer. Um, he's described by family members and friends as just being stodgy and and just kind of an old fogey um not a lot of not a lot of humor in his life apparently uh, but he takes his daughter uh being kidnapped again from his his point of view very seriously 
and that will that will fester and he will act upon that at a, at a later time so as the story comes into to utah and uh, bill will fill in uh, fill in the details of the story but we bring in this character his name is washington mccormick and um he's the u.s attorney for utah territory and he during a trial that occurs when uh, the father tries to get his daughter back he is co-counsel with ag brown and so they become associated that way uh, with the law and this guy figures in he is the u.s marshal uh, for utah territory he has arrived in the territory in 1850 and interestingly, shortly after he arrives, he and Brigham Young enter into a, a business venture, and that business venture is a brewery. So kind of an unusual, an unusual venture for uh, Brigham Young from our perspective today to be involved in. But um, Dotson is a brand new uh, marshal. Uh, just appointed in 1857, so shortly before this court case with, with Henrietta uh, occurs. We also have Judge Eccles. Judge Eccles has traveled with the Army um, across the plains. He is up at Camp Scott, and um, as Bill mentioned, A.G. Brown becomes uh, clerk for the court, and he is about to go in and to become a member of the uh, Supreme Court of the, the Territory of, of Utah. And uh, he ends up being the judge on this case for, for young Henrietta. Um, we have other characters that are kind of bit players. We have uh, the aide-de-camp from, from uh, Albert Sidney Johnston, Lieutenant Williams. Um, and what happens is that when Henry makes an appeal, he goes through Queen Victoria's government. And the appeal goes immediately through official de uh, departments and ends up at the cabinet level for President Buchanan. And uh, several of his cabinet members get involved, one of them being um, Lewis Cass, who is Secretary of State. He becomes very involved. And his counterpart on the British side is Lord Napier. And he's the British minister in Washington, DC, serving for uh, Her Majesty's government in, in Washington. Um, but back in Britain, we have some other characters that that uh, are, are famous in literary circles and, and artistic circles, especially. This is Christina Rossetti. And I remember reading some of her poetry in uh, as an undergraduate at BYU um, in my uh, initial English class as a freshman. And Christina is a member of England's uh, what's called Pre-Raphael Brotherhood. And um, it, it's it's quite a quite a famous gathering of, of artists and poets and writers and and um, it turns out that she's <laughs> she's related to to Henrietta and writes uh, several poems over the course of her career that are addressed or about Henrietta. One of them is addressed to H. P., which is Henrietta Polydor. And another one is addressed to Lala, which is the family nickname for young Henrietta. And so Christina uh, just keeps close track on this story and, and um, just, just follows it, as does her brother. Uh, this is Dante um, Rossetti, and he's, he's actually uh, quite a well-known uh, British artist from the mid-19th century uh, of that uh, pre-Raphael uh, brotherhood. And he actually paints uh, both the father, that, uh, that drawing I showed you of Henry Polidor, that was done by Dante. And he also uh, sketches young Henrietta. And, uh, and, and it, it's just an interesting story because he's friends with a guy named Lewis Carroll, <laughs> who, who writes Alice in Wonderland. And it's just, it's just an interesting mix of, of personalities that are involved with all of this. And of course, since it's Utah in the 1850s, Brigham Young gets involved, but really only as a bit player. Um, Brigham doesn't figure prominently into this. He does not wade into this, into this court case um, very directly, but he's had several relations with several of the people that are involved in it closer. And then we've got Jim Bridger gets involved. And uh, the 1877 War of the Three Guardians just paints a fun picture of Jim Bridger. <laughs> 
And uh, A.G. Brown puts very colloquial speech into Jim Bridger's mouth. And it's just just fun to listen to the way that Brown has uh, Bridger speaking. And so he, he gets uh, in, involved as well. So with that cast of characters, I'll turn it over to Bill and let him talk about the, the main storyline. Okay, thank you, Ken. So we're back to, with this slide, uh, an image of uh, young Henrietta and on the left, and of course, Albert G. Brown Jr. Uh, on the right. And the photograph of Brown was taken during the Civil War when he was a Lieutenant Colonel in the uh, Union Army and the military secretary to Governor Andrew, the uh, governor of the Commonwealth of uh, Massachusetts. So what did, what did Brown fashion from and through all these characters to create what he called uh, the Ward of the Three Guardians in the Atlantic Monthly in 1877. Uh, what he wrote is referred to as a novella, meaning basically a short novel. But as you'll see, as we march through all this, although it was a novella and technically fiction, it was based on fact, largely the dispatches that Brown had written 20 years earlier for Horace Greeley's uh, Atlantic Monthly. And I'll start with the odd nature of the novella's title, The Ward of the Three Guardians. It, it's an opaque one, as I think about it, with lasting consequences that consigned uh, this piece of work to oblivion. I mean, people couldn't figure out what it was about uh, just by reading the title. Uh, the rationale for the title's not clear, to readers until they get about halfway through the novella in terms of understanding what or who the ward was, that being Henrietta, and how she related to the guardians, the three people that Ken identified, uh, Peter K. Dotson, the U.S. Marshal, Washington J. McCormick, the U.S. Attorney for Utah, and of course, Albert G. Brown, Jr. You, you, you find out about their roles only halfway through the novel. So it's it's an opaque title that left people wondering, and I think was largely responsible for the obscurity of this uh, work of literature since 1877. The fact that it doesn't surface in Google searches is another reason for its obscurity. I mean, there's nothing in that title, The Word of the Three Guardians, that would make you think about polygamy, Utah, Mormons, English girls, Boston uh, war correspondents. So all in all, it's an unusual title that Brown chose and with probably the help of his editor and that consigned it to oblivion until Ken and I unearthed it and decided it was worth uh, calling to the, the attention of people interested in the Utah war. Then there's uh, Brown's puzzling and inconsistent use of pseudonyms, that is real names for some characters, made up names for others. And on the next slide, Ken, you'll see a, a list of the pseudonyms. Uh, it, it's so confusing in a way that we created this document as part of our book about the whole affair. Uh, and on the left, you have the cast of characters that are in the novella, and on the right, you have who they really were, what their actual names were, as Ken just described them and showed images of them. So Henrietta Polidor ends up being Henrietta Perigo, uh, and uh, her aunt, Jane Mayer Richards, who became the uh, third wife of Samuel W. Richards, is described in the novella as Jane Moore Peckham. Uh, Richards himself is Sam Peckham, not Samuel W. Richards, and on and on it goes. But it's a mixture of made up pseudonyms and real uh, names, like Jim Bridger is referred to as Jim Bridger, as is Brigham Young. So it's the inconsistency that's a, a little bit puzzling. Well, in terms of the story, um, it starts with uh, Albert Brown early in 1858, January of 1858, making preparations at Albert Sidney Johnson's request to return east from the Army's winter quarters at Fort Bridger with General Johnson's dispatches for the War Department and the members of the 
Buchanan administration like Secretary of State Lewis Cass. And here we first learn through Jim Bridger's dialogue in the novella of the flight of the mayor and Polidora women from England to Utah in 1854 through 1855. The women involved left no account of how they fled England in 1854 and arrived in Salt Lake City in 1855. So the best account we have of what happened was Brown's description of it, which I'm convinced he got from a combination of talking to Jim Bridger at Camp Scott and to Jane Mayer uh, Richards in Salt Lake City during the summer of 1858. <clears throat> then the novella goes on with this background uh, to follow Brown's epic march east with four other men in the dead of winter to bring dispatches to the Buchanan administration uh, there's no discussion uh, in the novella about his visits to his family in Salem, his friends in Boston, and then the administration in Washington, D.C., and no discussion in it of his trip back to Utah in the spring of 1858. So Ken and I have had to piece that together and in our book uh, about this whole affair. You'll see detail about how that happened. Next slide, please, Ken. The novella then goes on uh, once uh, Brown places the mayor and Polidor women in Salt Lake City, goes on to discuss Henrietta's sequestration and Samuel W. Richards' Salt Lake City home. And here you see one of the main streets in Salt Lake at that time. Uh, the, the biggest settlement between the, the Missouri River and San Francisco, but still very much of a, of a small town. Next slide, please. And part of Henry's uh, sequestration uh, in Salt Lake City, living with her aunt as a, the poor wife of Samuel W. Richards, uh, was her the alias that was used. She was called not Henrietta, but Lucy, which was a name made up by Samuel W. Richards and Jane Mayer Richards in order to disguise her presence in Salt Lake City and in effect hide her location from her father. And what you see outlined in red is the entry in the Utah Territorial Census for 1856 that lists Henrietta. Uh, next slide, please. Henrietta's father found out about Henrietta's presence at Salt Lake City uh, in the late winter of 1858 through a former uh, Mormon uh, missionary, um, Henry Hyde Jr., who you see uh, sort of demonized in a uh, cartoon in one of the Salt Lake newspapers. Uh, and, and after Henry Hyde Jr. left the church, he spent a lot of time in New Orleans, and there he picked up the story of the Mayor and Polidor women's uh, flight from England to Utah by way of New Orleans and the Mississippi and then Missouri rivers. And Henry Hyde Jr. told Henrietta's father back in Gloucestershire, England, that is, uh, out in his location, being under an alias in Salt Lake City, which then triggered the diplomatic maneuvering that Ken described the father going to the British Foreign Ministry in London the foreign ministry writing the British ambassador to the United States, Lord Napier, Lord Napier talking to Secretary of State Lewis Cass, Lewis Cass chucking the football to the Secretary of War, John B. Floyd, and Floyd then tasking General Johnston in Utah with retrieving Henrietta, and General Johnston then promptly handed off to Washington J. McCormick, the U.S. Attorney for <clears throat> Utah, and at that point, the court proceedings in the U.S. District Court in Salt Lake City to retrieve Henrietta uh, took place. And we won't go into all the details about the trial, but basically, uh, Washington J. McCormick, the district attorney, and Albert G. Brown, a freelancing Harvard-trained uh, uh, lawyer, teamed up uh, to pursue the retrieval of Henrietta through a writ of habeas corpus brought on behalf of her father. 
The result was that uh, the father's suit prevailed and he was awarded custody of Henrietta, although he was still in England himself. And Judge Eccles decreed that Henrietta was to be returned to England forthwith, but without considering the mechanism of how this was going to happen specifically. During the period in which Henrietta was uh, remanded uh, to the custody of her father, uh, she was put in the care of the U.S. Marshal Peter K. Dotson as a temporary guardian, and he in turn deputized uh, informally uh, Washington J. McCormick and Albert G. Brown Jr. to help him. Hence, the three of them became co-guardians, or as it turned out in the title of the book that Brown wrote 20 years later, The Three Guardians in the Ward of the Three Guardians with Henrietta, of course, being the ward. Um, next, please. Henrietta left Salt Lake City in September of 1858 with an entourage gathered by Judge Eccles himself, who decided he wanted to take a leave of absence in Indiana. And along with him, uh, had his known as Jade Moore in the novel. Uh, and a small party of English Mormon refugees fleeing Utah, traveled with Judge Eccles and under his protection across the Rockies and the Plains to uh, uh, the states uh, uh, east of uh, the Great Plains. And as part of all this, Judge Eccles fabricated a myth which he sent to the State Department about a 500 mile chase across the Great Plains by the Nauvoo Legion. Ken and I are convinced that never happened but it's sort of a, a stock piece of anti-Mormon literature to have a chase scene, usually at night involving damsels in distress with shadowy church assassins or members of that religion. This group arrived at Lord Napier's embassy in Washington in December of 1858 with a newly returned Brown coming down from Boston and Henry and his mother coming up from the family's new home in Louisiana. Henrietta's mother, uh, as Ken uh, indicated, also named Henrietta, tried mightily to prevent her daughter's repatriation to England and the custody of her estranged husband, but that failed. And Henrietta was returned to England via uh, uh, a Cunard Line packet ship sailing out of New York. The ship was the SS uh, Africa. So the novella that I've just described uh, in, in quick fashion uh, was a, a mixture of fact, uh, much of it based on the dispatches, which Brown had written based on firsthand experience in Utah during 1857 and 1858, and where he was lacking information, a fair amount of fiction. Uh, we think a lot of the dialogue about Jim Bridger and his, uh, his acquaintanceship with the ladies from England near Fort Bridger in 1854 was made up by Brown because he needed a story element and he wasn't there to have seen it. So he had Jim Bridger describing it. So the, the, the book is very much a blend of fact and fiction. And it's what we've come to call as Truman Capote did with his novel, In Cold Blood, a nonfiction novel in many respects. Ken, uh, and what you see here is the Cunard liner uh, SS Africa, which plied between Liverpool, England, and New York uh, every two weeks. It was the, the fastest way of getting across the Atlantic, and it was on that that Henrietta sailed in the custody of a royal messenger who had been deputized by uh, Lord Napier at the embassy in Washington to take her home, and that's what happened. Ken, if you'll quickly show the next two slides. These are, we're not going to dwell on the details here, but this will just give you a feel for the tra travels of Albert G. Brown Jr. in connection with this story. Seven different trips uh, with various legs, including several across the plains and back, seven in total uh, during 1857-58, and then uh, the next slide, you see Henrietta's travels. There they are. 
different routes that Brown took, of course, including the one to, to New Orleans and up the Mississippi to get to Utah to begin with. I just emphasize the, the sheer staggering volume and distances involved in this story. That's factual. And this was a period when most Americans never left the county they were born in. So th this degree of travel on the part of a little English girl ending up in Salt Lake City and Albert G. Brown of Boston, Bob Brabham, working as a war correspondent in Utah was quite unusual uh, in its day. So with that, I'm turning it over to Ken, who will tell you a bit of the epilogue involved here. So what we've got then is we've got this story that uh, takes place, um, you know, <laughs> all, all over the place, and and so here's the here's the bottom line. And in the in the novella, Brown has to have some kind of conclusion. So he just basically makes up wholesale the conclusion of the novella, but. Um, to look at what happens to some of these characters, um, we've got Samuel W. Um, Richards, and he serves in the Utah Territorial Legislature, but he never, never really receives church prominence like um, like his uh, uncle and, and brother. Um, and um, he has a bit of a falling out at one point with Brigham Young. And uh, then we look at uh, Washington J. McCormick, and he he uh, practices law in Salt Lake for a while after that after that uh, experience repatriating Henrietta, and then he moves to Montana, uh, where he's an entrepreneur and a legislator and an attorney and and actually quite uh, quite well known in in Montana history. His son, um, capitalizing on the notoriety of his father and then expanding on it actually becomes a U.S. Senator from the state of Montana. Um, then we've got Peter K. Dotson. This is a picture of him, uh, obviously, much later in life. And he, as Bill mentioned, is the only court-appointed guardian. The other two guardians of the three guardians, he kind of kind of brings in and deputizes. But he moves um, after some other incidents in, in, in Utah. He moves to Pueblo, Colorado. And that's actually where we where we found this photo of him. Um, Judge Eccles, an interesting guy, he returns home to Greencastle, uh, Indiana, and uh, he he stays in Utah until just about the begin uh, into the beginning of the Civil War and leaves in 1861. And then we've got the father. This is this is Henry who starts that that court case after he learns from um, John Hyde Jr. what's happened to Henrietta, and he gets his daughter back. But by family letters and, and from other accounts that we've been able to piece together, uh, they're just not ever really close. Henrietta's there in Britain, but she spends a great deal of time, as Bill showed on that map, crossing the Atlantic back to see her mother. She makes multiple trips. And uh, as far as A.G. Brown, um, he, he meets a, a well-known abolitionist in uh, in the Boston area, her name is her nickname is Maddie, and uh, she's she's quite a unique individual. She dresses in scarlet from head to toe in some accounts <laughs> to get people's attention, so she can highlight the cause of the abolitionists. and uh, And they have a, a marriage there in in uh, in Boston. Then we've got uh, Henrietta herself, and. She, she does return to the to the UK in January of 1859, as Bill mentioned, uh, on the on the Africa. Um, it's she she doesn't leave us much. Uh, one of the few regrets we had with we found a lot of, about this story, but one of the one of the regrets is that Henrietta doesn't leave us much. Um, and as she is crossing the Atlantic back and forth multiple times, at some point, either there or in Britain she unfortunately contracts tuberculosis and she dies in uh, Mississippi City in uh, September of 1874. Um, and so still still quite young. And uh, Christina Rossetti, her, her cousin, is just beside herself when she when she passes. 
Um, there's lots more to this story, but uh, but that's the the big outlines. And now I'll turn it over to Bill for some some concluding thoughts. Okay, a couple of quick conclusions. Uh, we're back to uh, our starting photographs of the two main characters, Henrietta and Albert G. Brown Jr. Uh, basically, what Ken and I have done is to surface a forgotten Utah War source and make it available and understandable for a 21st century audience. We, we think it was worth doing. Uh, for reasons I, I described earlier, uh, this piece of work that Brown must have put in a lot of work on just disappeared once it was published in 1877. And we brought it back because in some cases, it's the only source of information about certain aspects of the Utah War. Henrietta, is herself largely forgotten except for people who are very riveted on the Rossetti siblings. Uh, Christine Georgina Rossetti, the poet, and Dante Gabrielle Rossetti, the painter. Uh, it's well known among people that follow those two in England that they had a cousin who was very ill and uh, about whom they painted and wrote. But the whole Utah chapter of it is unknown in England to this day. And the only connection between this story and England today is what you'll see in the next two slides. The connection is this sailboat. It's a 31 foot sloop home ported it near Dartmouth on the Devon coast of England. And the, the name of the boat is the Henrietta Polidori. And here it is docked on the River Dart. This is one of its owners, Jill Butler. She and her husband, Miles, are the owners of it. They bought the boat, the name came with it, and they were generally aware that Henrietta was part of the low English family that involved the Rossettis, but they had no idea of what the Utah chapter of it was until we got a hold of them and started asking questions. So here they are with their sailboat in the River Dart, uh, which has some connection also to our own Ken Alford. Ken was a, a missionary in that part of England along the Devon coast, and he didn't see the sailboat at that did time. Did not see it. <laughs> Probably hadn't been built, but he did, he did do a lot of proselytizing and uh, seeing the sailboat on the River Dart near where he was uh, based as a missionary brought back some memories to him. But this is the only, tangible connection between our story and any awareness in England of it. Well, thanks to this research, we now have a better and a more complete understanding of who Albert G. Brown was and the decades long nature of his Utah war roles, first as a correspondent during 1857-58, then as a lecturer in Massachusetts in 1859, the author of a three-part narrative about the Utah War and the Atlantic Monthly published in 1859, and then finally, the author of a now forgotten novella titled The Word of the Three Guardians. If Brown didn't invent the nonfiction novel, he was an earlier practitioner, a very early practitioner of this literary form that we now know uh, that Truman Capote didn't invent in the mid 1960s in writing his in cold blood. We also now know who Henrietta Polidor was and how she fit into the talented Anglo-Italian Rossetti family and its famous poetry and art, some of which involved her. It's also clear, I think, in what ways the Utah War was regional and international in its scope, not just a local conflict centered on places like Utah and Washington, D.C. I think one of the other conclusions Ken and I have come to is that it's now clear how women were involved in the Utah War on both sides. And in surfacing this story, it's one way of, we have of emphasizing and underscoring this point by considering the plucky, courageous, tenacious behavior of Henrietta I, the mother, Henrietta II, her daughter, and Henrietta III, the young girl, who's at the center of the story. There are other women involved in the Utah war. We're not gonna go into the details on that, 
but it, it, it's a great story, a great read. And the Utah War was not just the all male show that most people think of it. There's the, the fascinating case of Jenny Goodale, a Shoshone princess who accompanied Captain Marcy in his epic trek from Fort Bridger to Northern New Mexico to remount and resupply the Utah expedition during the winter of 1858. She was one of the most colorful women involved. One offbeat conclusion that we've also come to is if you're going to write a novel as Brown did, or a book about one as Ken and I did, pick a title that conveys what it's about and that can be surfaced by internet search engines such as Google. Another conclusion of ours is the power of serendipity. Serendipity and unearthing this story and finding out who did what to whom. And the photograph of Henrietta, which we have on the cover of the, of the book and which you saw several times in the course of this talk, was unearthed by Ken at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London through an act of serendipity. I'd been researching this story for over 50 years and I, I saw the sketch that Dante Gabriel Rossetti had done in 1863, but I never knew there was a photograph of young Henrietta until Ken dug it out uh, through a great act of serendipity. And that brings me to my final conclusion, and that is not only the power of serendipity with this story, but the power of collaboration between Ken and me in bringing it to you. Uh, we come from very different backgrounds, live in very different regions, are of different religions, went to different schools, but we have a very common interest, a friendship and a sense of respect for one another that's been powerful in helping us bring this story to you today. And so I'll leave it at that. And Holly, if you've got some questions that you think attendees might ask if they were here in the room with us today, why don't you go ahead and see if we have any answers for you? All right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, that was wonderful. That, what a good story. Um, all right. I am going to pull up my questions here. First of all, I just have to say the involvement of the Rosettis blew me away. I've <laughs> loved the Rosettis since I was, you know, 12 or something. Um, <laughs> that really, it just ups the significance so much. And the international scope and the involvement with literature again all those those tropes about mormons in 19th century literature i i love it um, i'll just i'll just add real quick that a lot yeah. of the accounts of of how dour henry's personality is come from dante oh they're 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 family letters to other family members and 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 he just he just paints a really unflattering picture of of, of Henry's day-to-day -day wow. life. <laughs> but but most of that most of it is from Dante. The family did wow. the family did not view Henry little Henry yeah. and his father as a fun guy. <laughs> That's fun. Oh um, can I ask the question that I had, and, and you you touched on it and both of you a bit was um what did Henrietta herself want? Did anyone ask her? Did anyone care? <laughs> um, good, good question. Let, We're let, not sure, but I yeah. suspect from the way the novella played out that originally she didn't want to return to England. She'd been huh. living for, uh, let's see, uh, four years, I guess, yeah. three, three and a half years in a polygamous household in Salt Lake City with her aunt, who, with whom she had a very good relationship. I mean, we've described her as being from her father's point, sort of kidnapped, but we think Henrietta got along quite well with her Aunt Jane. Hmm. And I don't think she wanted to leave. I mean, her mother was uh, living in uh, Mississippi, running a, uh, a resort hotel quite successfully. Uh, her father wasn't what we label a fun guy. And in the novella, Brown has a scene in which after Henrietta is remanded to the custody of the guardians by Judge Eccles, she sort of slaps in the face, uh, lash down. And uh, I don't know if that really happened, but I think Brown's way of describing the likelihood that she probably wanted to stay in Salt Lake and not go back to, to England. 
But it's a good question, uh, Holly. I would, no I, would add, I would add that Henrietta III, young Henrietta, uh, the ward, she never is baptized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. So even though she is, by all, you know, by all indications, comfortable there in Salt Lake, she never... Mm -hmm. She never actually joins the faith of her aunt uh, or the head of the household, um, Richards. Yeah. So I, I just find that just a just an interesting little tidbit. Um, and and again, we I just wish we had some you know pocket diary or something. Yeah. From but her. The, but the Rossettis write quite a bit about. Yeah. About Henrietta being an observant Catholic in the sense of she wasn't a Mormon, they didn't go into any of that, but they did talk about her involvement in the church rites uh, uh, and celebrations of the Roman Catholic Church. Hmm. However, um, yeah, however yeah. her mother, her mother who moved to Utah in the 1880s or 90s rather from coastal Mississippi, her mother did perform temple rites for the benefit of Henrietta. Uh, mm -hmm. Henrietta, of course, at that point was long dead, had passed away, as Ken described, of TB in 1874. But in the 18th, before she died, Henrietta's mother, who we call Henrietta II, did perform temple rites uh, on behalf of uh, Henrietta. And years later, some unidentified Latter day Saint added to that temple work also. So mm -hmm. was she? LDS or was she not? I mean, you, depends how you look at it. Yeah, there's there's no record of her baptism. I can say that um, and, in life. And so and her I guess, mother, as Bill mentioned, uh, Utah and lived in Ogden for a while, also lives in Utah County for. Huh. Um, Go ahead, Holly. Well, I, I guess we don't know then if she had any affection for Samuel Richards or anything of that sort. Just there's so little known about her. We do know what Richards thought about her and and unless it was wholly one-sided, Richards was very solicitous about bringing Henry up properly in his polygamous household. And he, when he went back to England to be the president of the British mission a second time, he wrote to Jane, uh, his wife in Salt Lake City, repeatedly about the need to take care of Henrietta, to make sure she was enrolled in schools properly, and to note that Henrietta was much better off than the young girls he saw passing through cities like New York and Baltimore on his way to, to England. So he was very solicitous about the little girl, and, and I think acted in good faith as a surrogate father, as opposed to neglecting or abusing her. Uh, whether That's she good. reciprocated that sense of responsibility and affection, I don't know, but it was clear he felt it. And mm -hmm. in part, in parting with you all, I'll just make a note that there's a copy of the book bobbing up and down in the sloop Henrietta Polidori on the <laughs> on the River Dart in Devon. That's Edward, perfect. On That's this very perfect. day, so oh, I love it. Has returned uh, in book form as well as uh, in the flesh, so to speak. I love it. I love the connection. Well, this has been this has been a lot of fun. So thank you both, and um, thank you. We'll see you later. I hope. Okay. Happy conference. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.